And good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is the place and the time of the presentation of the PhD thesis today. <clears throat> and first of all, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Michael Prasa. I come from the ETH in Zurich in Switzerland. And I have the great honor to be the president of this uh, presentation and defense today. And the candidate is Mr. Antoine Dupré. And it is an extra pleasure for me to be the president of exactly this defense, because Antoine was a student of mine in Zurich. We have a joint master program of nuclear engineering that is run jointly by the ETH in Zurich and the Ecole Polytechnique de Lausanne, de Lausanne uh, in, in the west of Switzerland. And, uh, and Andy Preu has graduated in this program. So now I would like not to waste too much time with the introduction, just to open the floor for the candidate. And you see the topic is electrical impedance tomography for void fraction measurements in, uh, in harsh two-phase flows, in harsh means harsh environments. And uh, I've read the thesis. It is an exciting work with a lot of electronics behind and also simulations as well as experiments. And it combines theory and experiment. So I hope that you will enjoy and also the talk and also find your interest in this work. And I would like to give the floor to Antoine Dupré for the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you for your kind introduction. So, dear members of jury, colleagues, and friends, I'm glad to be today defending my PhD thesis that is entitled Electrical Impedance Tomography for Work Fraction Measurements of Arch Two Phase Flows, Prototype Development, and Reconstruction Techniques. So, it was conducted at the laboratory of Agromechanics in CA Cadarache during three years under the supervision of Guillaume Riccardi and the direction of Salah Renan from Ecole Centrale in Marseille. The outline of today's presentation will be as follows. I will start giving you some context about flow visualization techniques with an emphasis on electrical tomography. Then I will describe the prototype sensor that is the main result for, for this PhD thesis. And then we will see two techniques to analyze the signal on an electrical tomography sensor. The first is the flow regime identification methodology, and then we will see the image reconstruction techniques. I will conclude and give some perspectives for this research. Let's start with an introduction to visualization techniques for multiphase flows. The general context is that there's a need for instrumentation that is specific to multiphase flows which is driven by industrial applications that are illustrated here. And because multiphase flows have a very complex dynamics, <coughs> it's by knowing the distribution of the phases that we will get insights on key physics of heat transfer, fluid structure coupling, reaction kinetics, and other physics effects. More specifically, at the laboratory of hydromechanics, we are interested in two analysis of heat exchanges in nuclear power plants, and in those applications, we deal with high pressure, high temperature, two-phase flows, and therefore it's very challenging to integrate uh, the adequate sensor in such an environment. There's a set of well-established techniques to visualize multi-phase flows, and they can be differentiated into categories, whether they are intrusive or not. In the first category, illustrated on this slide, are local and global probes. So the idea of local probes is to measure a physical parameter, either based on optical or electrical properties, to deduce the phase in a very small local volume, and usually with a very good time resolution. Um, the idea of the global sensors, as I will stay, say it, is uh, I'm illustrating this with the wire mesh sensor, and we use uh, two sets of electrode wires 
which will act as an effective set of many local probes based on electrical properties. And by using global probes, we got cross-sectional images of the flow with a very good time resolution. So this is what we aim for uh, in uh, visualization of multiphase flows. The non-intrusive instrumentations are based on the principle of tomography, which is to generate an excitation from outside the object, which will propagate in the object, and we will measure the system response. To get a tomographic uh, frame, we need many measurements with different view angles. So we will uh, repeat these projections to get a tomographic data set. So I'm illustrating this with four examples. And the two on the top are so-called R-field tomography techniques. The two are Sophie tomography techniques. So in X-ray tomography that is widely used in medical uh, research and imaging, uh, we are analyzing the attenuation of a ray between a source and a detector. And it will give us information about the material properties of the object. It's called the R-field tomography technique because the propagation of the ray is not affected by the material properties. In order to get the tomographic data, we need to rotate either the object or the sensor to get the full set of uh, views of the object. In magnetic resonance, another well-established technique in medical imaging, uh, we are analyzing the nuclear magnetic resonance properties of uh, materials. And to perform a scan, we use a time-varying magnetic field gradient. Now, in ultrasound tomography and electrical tomography, those belong to the category of salt field tomography techniques because the propagation of the wave is influenced by the material properties. So, for example, anomalies in an object in ultrasound tomography will cause diffusion and will change the sensitivity of this sensor, which will make the analysis more complex. So, in ultrasound tomography, we are analyzing the attenuation and time of light of transmitted and scattered waves from emitter to receivers surrounding the object. And in electrical tomography, we are analyzing the electrical impedance of the object. So these are a list of tomography techniques which feature non-invasiveness. Based on the goals of this PhD thesis, I've listed a list of specifications I want for the instrumentation to be developed. First of all, I'd like to have non-intrusive instrumentation because that will mean the integration to a harsh environment will be simpler. Second, I'd like to be the sensor to be compatible with a cylindrical metallic enclosure of roughly 10 cm in diameter <coughs> because that's representative of what you have in uh, industrial pipings and also in research uh, experiments. Finally, I like the spatial and temporal resolution of my instrument to be as good as possible to match the typical flow characteristic length and time scales of multiphase flows that can be very low depending on the flows. So I made an overview of the literature about the aforementioned tomography techniques. And this is summarized in this table. The conclusion is that, as you can guess from the title of this PhD thesis, I've opted for electrical tomography. There's very good uh, features of radiation-based tomography and magnetic resonance imaging, mainly due to the fact they are upfield tomography techniques, which results in a simpler analysis of the signal and a better spatial resolution. However, there are some issues with the complexity to use and implement those techniques, and also with the temporal resolutions. In ultrasound tomography techniques, there are two main drawbacks. First, it's a soft field tomography techniques, which degrades the spatial resolution. And second, it's the time resolution is intrinsically limited by the time the sound has to propagate in the medium, which gets bigger with bigger systems. 
Finally, in electrical tomography, the time resolution is much better because the propagation of electromagnetic waves is much uh, higher. Electrical tomography comes in two versions. Uh, in resistance tomography or impedance tomography, we aim at imaging the electrical conductance of a conductive object. So we use low frequency excitations, which are usually weak currents that we inject between a source and drain electrodes. So the main features of these techniques are the electrical contact between the fluid and the sensor, which means the sensor is invasive, though it's non-intrusive. Uh, we, we are imaging conductive mixtures, which puts uh, constraints on the continuous phase that needs to be a conductor. The main benefit is the spatial resolution, which is be usually better than in the next technique we will see. And the pipe that can be metallic if you provide uh, insulation uh, by applying a special coating. In capacitance tomography, we aim at imaging the electrical permittivity of insulating objects, which is the capability of a material to polarize under the influence of an electrical field. So we use high frequency excitations, which are usually uh, high amplitude voltage on one source electrode. Because we have uh, no current flow, the sensor is truly non-invasive and we can locate the electrode on the outer surface of the pipe. We are uh, imaging insulating mixtures, which means there's applications, notably in the oil industry, which are not possible with impedance tomography. However, the signals are weaker and therefore uh, we use larger electrodes, which degrades the lower, the spatial resolution in the end. Uh, additionally, it's not possible to have a pipe made of metal because that would shield the object from the excitation you're imposing. So for this very last reason, I've concluded that uh, it was not, uh, it didn't meet the requirements for the high pressure or temperature applications, which is that uh, I need to have a compatibility with a metallic enclosure. And therefore, I opted for electrical impedance tomography. The fundamentals of the principle of uh, electrical tomography in terms of experiments is the following. So in the simplest version you can think of, illustrated here, uh, with only two electrodes surrounding the object, by setting a voltage with a battery and measuring the current, you get a value of the resistance and you can deduce a one pixel image of your object, which of course is not satisfying. So as you increase the number of electrodes, the principles stay the same. Uh, we are using successive excitations, which are currents that you inject between pairs of electrodes, which can be alternating current or DC pulse currents. And we measure the system response on the surrounding electrodes. And as you can see on this simulation of the um, electrical potential for an excitation and a two-phase flow, um, the electrical field lines get distorted by the presence of the gas phase. Uh, and therefore, by measuring the system response on all electrodes, you get a very good information about the, uh, the material content of the object. To get tomographic data, we need to uh, replicate this um, procedure for all the projections we can have. And for example, with this 16 electrode sensor I've illustrated, that means we have uh, up to 120 projections at maximum to acquire to get a full scan. So in terms of signal analysis, the principle is the following. Uh, the first step is the forward problem, which is to predict what will be the system response uh, to an excitation set on the boundary given the properties of the object, electrical properties of the object. So for that, we will use the Maxwell laws for electromagnetism, 
and the constitutive equations for the material properties. And combining them, we end up with the equations for uh, electrical tomography. And it turns out that they are similar for resistance tomography and capacitance tomography. And the only difference is in that term that is called the complex impedance. It has, its real part is driven by the conductance of the object and its imaginary part is driven by both the frequency and the T electrical uh, permittivity constant of the materials. So that's the only difference in, which is very weak in terms of signal analysis between resistance and capacitance tomography. In uh, inverse problem, the next step, we aim at reconstructing the electrical properties of the object, which correspond to our tomographic data set and will give us information about the material properties of the object. And I'd like to mention quickly the main difference between hard field tomography and soft field tomography. In hard field tomography, uh, the sensitivity of a measurement is independent of the material properties of the object. And therefore, it makes the inversion much simpler. In soft field tomography, because uh, the electromagnetic waves tend to circumvent obstacles, we will have much more challenges in uh, the inverse problem. Now I'd like to talk about the development of the prototype sensor that is the result of the PhD thesis. Uh, it consists in three models. Uh, one is the signal generation and data acquisition unit. One is the interfacing circuit. And finally, the test section that contains the object which is uh, free to be imaged. It features mainly high frame rate and therefore online display is possible as is illustrated in this video. And you can also see the test section that is very adequate to make simple static experiments uh, with uh, plastic rods that are mimicking the gas phase. So that's the setup for this prototype sensor. I've illustrated again the three models that I'm using. And the pr principle, the protocol of uh, tomography is the following. So I need to connect electrically my object with the system via 16 electrodes that are surrounding the object. I will measure the um, electrode difference of electrical potential between pairs of adjacent electrodes uh, with my PEXC system. And in, in the meantime, I will generate the excitation signal, which is uh, voltage, alternating voltage. I will measure the current that is actually injected in the test section via a measure of the voltage drop across a sense resistor. And now the role of the interfacing circuit is to route this excitation signal to the target source and drain electrodes for my projection. So I'm using <laughs> multiplexers, which are electronic components with one input and 16 uh, outputs. And with digital commands, I'm selecting the output that will be active. So that is the target source and drain electrodes. The test section is a cylinder of inner diameter 10 cm, and it's made of PMMA, which is an insulator. So I mentioned before, the idea is that we need to have compatibility with metallic enclosure. However, the, there's a, for sensitivity reasons, it's interesting to have an insulating enclosure because it prevents electrical currents to leak into the enclosure, which will in the end, which would in the end decrease the sensitivity of the sensor. So the ID when I will, we will go for high pressure at temperature test section will be to apply an insulating coating on the inner surface of the pipe, which will be metallic. But this is the setup for the prototype sensor. It has two configurations, the 3D configuration and 2D configuration. And uh, the 16 electrodes are arranged around the holding ring on the same actual plane. So this is important. And finally, 
The specificity is that the, what I call the point-like electrode design is that the cross-section of the electrode is very small as compared to the length for the travel, for the current to flow. And that has implications on the properties of this prototype. Uh, on this image, you see the simple, simple system to position the anomalies at specific locations. So one of the main uh, challenges I've met uh, during the development of this prototype is the following. So on these two figures, you can see the impedance measurements I make for the 120 projections of my, with my system. And that's for uh, either for the 2D configuration or 3D configuration with only water in the, in the test section. I would expect to observe some kind of symmetry because of the symmetry of the electrodes. So this is illustrated in a numerical study that I made. So uh, to compensate uh, some uh, errors that could happen, I tried to add in my model what I call the uh, electrical uh, electrode specific impedance. And I have 16 of them, which are linked to my electrodes. And I have 120 projections so I can solve this system. And then when I subtract this electrode specific impedance for all of my measurements. Uh, it's a kind of calibration procedure. And therefore, I get uh, results that are coherent with my simulations. So there's a bias that is uh, causing electrospecific impedance. And the idea was how to identify the possible causes. So I thought of misplacement of electrodes and electrode electrolyte contact impedance. Uh, we will go through these problems in the next two slides. The idea of misplacement of electrode is that I could have a problem when I try to align my electrodes with the, with the inner surface of the, uh, of the test section. And so in order to study this, I made a simple model, which is that for a linear model of uh, resistance. So with resistance that would be proportional to the distance for the current to flow and inversely proportional to the, uh, cross, uh, to the surface for the current to flow. And so what happens if my electrode is slightly outcropping at the surface is that my resistance gets decreased by a small amount of uh, distance. And the bias in my uh, impedance measurement is now proportional to my, the misplacement of my electrode. However, in the alternative uh, case, what I have is a series of two resistors, the reference one that I have in my model, and an additional one that has small length and tiny cross-section. And because of the tiny cross-section, uh, the bias is still proportional to the misplacement of the electrode, but there come a factor the, which actually turns out to be amplifying when the surface of the electrode, contact surface between electrode and the fluid is small. And for that reason, the point-like electrode design is extremely sensitive to misplacement of electrodes. So that was the main cause for the mismatch of my uh, measurements with my models. The second possible option is the electrode electrolyte contact impedance. It's a phenomenon that occurs when you have an electrical current which in a ionic solution. And at the interface between the electrode and the ionic solution, uh, due to the electrical field, under the influence of the electrical field, the ions will arrange and form an uh, electrical double layer. And this will act as an additional capacitance to, the, to what is in the model. So I had to study this effect. Um, in this graph, you can see what happens when I change the excitation frequency and make a measurement of impedance for a given pair of electrodes selected. It's decreasing with an increasing excitation frequency. And this is due to the fact that when you have high excitation frequency, the ions do not have time to form the electrical double layer by the time the polarity of the current gets reversed. 
So for this reason, the effect is fading out with increasing excitation frequency. And when you work with this frequency range that was assessed experimentally, it turns out that it plays a minor role in the estimation of the impedance. However, there's another adverse effect, which I discover later. Um, when you have a sudden drop in current, for example, when you switch from one projection to another, some electrodes were used pre previously to inject the current and will not be used for current injections after. So this contact impedance is discharging and generates a residual voltage and you can see that it affects greatly some of the measurements. And this causes a bias in the early measurements. So there's two options for that. Either you discard those early measurements, but this is not an option if you want to go to high-speed operation of tomography. So there are some techniques to try to speed up the capacitance, uh, the, the discharge of the capacitance that were implemented. And it turns out that the point back electrode design term seems to be less sensitive to this uh, issue. So that was it about the problems that uh, were faced. I'd like to describe now the signal generation and data acquisition model. So there was a list of requirements. Um, the, our target is 1,000 frames per second, which puts a constraint on the minimum sampling rate. Uh, additionally, uh, there's a number of channels that I needed because of the protocol of electrical tomography. I need 15 analog input channels to measure the voltage between electrodes. Then I need one input channel to measure the current, one analog output channel to generate the excitation signal, and 10 digital output channels to send the commands to the multiplexers. There's two of them. And additionally, there's some constraint about the transfer rate in order to allow for high-speed logging of the data. And I found a commercial system that meets these specifications. The last model is the interfacing model. It's responsible for housing the multiplexers, the sense resistor, and the connectors to the electrodes and the PXE system. And so I've implemented it as a multi-layer printed circuit board using the standard guidelines for uh, electronic design. Finally, the protocol has been coded with the LabVIEW soft software. And uh, I'm illustrating it today with a, an early version of the code, which is non-synchronized, but it's more practical to explain. So I start with power, powering the multiplexer, so starting the system. Then I generate the excitation signal. So that means that I set the amplitude of the alternating voltage, its phase, and its excitation frequency. Then I will select the source and train electrodes by sending the digital commands to the multiplexers and make the acquisition. And finally, I will repeat this for the 120 projections in my system to get my tomographic data. And um, the main challenge in terms of coding the LabVIEW script was to synchronize the task for analog output, analog inputs, and digital outputs. Now, this allows for a prototype that uh, has fast imaging capabilities. So I've illustrated it with a simple experiment where I was dropping two spheres with different density in the liquid. So they would reach the plane, sensing plane, with different uh, velocities. And uh, the test is made at 600 67 frames per second. And so on the right, you see the stacked sequence of images. Uh, on the z-axis is the sequence of images, not the time exactly. Um, and then you see that the fast event is visible on almost 20 pictures. And the slow event, which is about 0.33 meters per second, is visible on almost 100 frames per second. And as a note, that's much better than what you get with the smartphone camera. So that was it about uh, the work done for the development of the prototype sensor. And I'd just like to have a quick word about a work in progress. So it's a new idea that would change the 
it would be applicable to different systems like you. So the idea would be to change uh, in, instead of using uh, successive excitations with the different projections, to replace it with a single excitation, which will be the superposition of all excitations taken at uh, different frequencies. So there are some uh, ideas that still need to be thought about, but uh, the main benefits of this method would be to increase the signal to noise ratio because we will have more samples available. And second, it will be due to the continuous excitation that it will suppress the transients and you will not have the problems uh, due to the contact capacitance that I mentioned before. So that's in progress work. Now, the next step is to think about ways to analyze the signal of these sensors because the electrical data doesn't make sense to the user. There's two approaches for that. The first one being the imaging approach where we aim at uh, reconstructing the detailed image of the local material properties. That's like uh, taking a video. However, the analysis is more complex and there are limitations because we have a salt field tomography sensor. So the alternative uh, approach that is specific to multiphase flows visualization is the identification approach, where the idea is to extract synthetic features from the flow regime uh, first and then other parameters. This is possible because we know that uh, in multiphase flows, due to the hydromechanics, we have a limited set of occurring topologies of the phase distribution. For example, uh, this is for horizontal developed flow. And therefore, we can restrict the outputs of uh, the algorithm, which will make it more robust and maybe faster. So this was the first approach that I attempted in this PhD thesis. And I needed a good insight uh, on the characteristic of each flow regime. And therefore, I was interested in gathering uh, experimental data. So I've uh, started, at the time, the prototype sensor was not fully functional. And I started a collaboration with Professor Miva Ganam from Norway. Uh, in their university at UCSN, they have a multi-phase flow rig, which allows the user to control the injection of each phases. So we can generate multi-phase flows with different conditions. And the phases are injected into a horizontal channel and it's controlled with, uh, it has state-of-the-art instrumentation. We know precisely what we inject and we have a transparent section for visualization and also high-speed camera recordings. And we have a section with a EC2 sensor. So it features 12 electrodes. And as mentioned in the introduction, there are many similarities between uh, the ECT and the ERT in terms of signal analysis. So this study is valid for the PhD thesis objectives. And so now, once we are in the case where we have the flow rig, so we have set the uh, angle of the pipe, the diameter of the pipe, the mixtures, and so on, there are two parameters left to the user of the rig, which are the flow rates of the each phase, the air and the water. And it's very usual to display them in a flow regime map illustrated here. Pay attention to the log scale. And so one position in this map uh, corresponds to a con condition of the flow. So each experiment is represented by one uh, point in this flow regime map. And it's also possible to display the zones for each flow regime that occur. And that's a practical tool for the users of the rig. So in practice, in experiments, what was observed is that at very low air and water flow rates, we would have the water flowing on the bottom of the pipe because gravity is prevailing. But as we increase the air flow rate, generate stress on the interface, and you see the emergence of waves. At even higher flow rates, you have a different flow regime called annular because the air is pushing the liquid to the wall of the pipe. Finally, if you increase the water flow rate instead, you get into the intermittent flow regime. Uh, the plug flow regime at that higher air flow rate, you will have the slug flow regime where you have entrainment of uh, gas bubbles in the liquid. Uh, 
body. So this is what you have in uh, this rig at UCSN. And the idea of the study was uh, for a given uh, signal of the ECT sensor for one experiment, which is a point in the Florida map, to compare the predictions of the identification algorithm with the observations we have in practice with other instruments. And so that's the first step to use the knowledge of the flow regime to identify other parameters that are specific to the flow regime. So the signal of the ECT sensor consists in uh, you excite one uh, source electrode and measure the, ca the charges on the surrounding electrodes. And this gives you the mutual capacitance that is a capacity that can be arranged into a matrix. So in experiments, you have a sequence of frames, uh, and it's and it's possible to arrange this sequence of capacitance matrices into a hyper matrix. But in the end, for a one minute experiment, we are left with a huge amount of data to process, that is almost one million. We need uh, to apply data reduction. So the first step has been to compress the dynamical information. And I've been using some statistical tools on uh, time series. And the second step was to compress the spatial information. And I used the ion value analysis that was proposed by some mathematicians, Fang and Kumberbatch. And this is rotationally invariant transform and gives an insight about the uh, level of asymmetry of an image. Now, uh, based on this uh, reduced data, I could propose some parameters that I compared with some thresholds that I tuned empirically. And this gave me the criteria that I arranged. And my algorithm, resulting algorithm, uh, helps to select for a given signal, input signal. It uh, makes a prediction of which of the five flow regime uh, is corresponding. And so uh, I made a test experiment, the, uh, validation uh, test data set. And for each experiment, I could compare with the observations in experiments. And there turned out to be very few failures, only for transitional flows that you cannot see very well. But uh, you see the transition lines here and the failures with the cycle. So in the end, that was a very good outcome of the development of this uh, algorithm. And I'd like briefly to mention the ongoing uh, research, which would be to change the way we analyze the success rate of the algorithm, because it will help us to tune better the parameters we are selecting. So instead of comparing the Boolean result, which is a binary, 0 or 1, and that, that makes uh, it very likely to have uh, failures by uh, chance at the transition. The idea is to replace it by the analysis of the parameters themselves that will be displayed on the complete flow regime map and to check if the, uh, if the contour lines of this parameter are matching or not the transitional lines that you observe in experiments. And that would make us more confident about the parameters that are proposed. So finally, about the image reconstruction method. As mentioned in the introduction, the aim is to solve the inverse problem, so finding the electrical properties of the object that correspond to the tomographic data. Uh, there are two main challenges because we are a solid tomography sensor. And there's two solutions for these challenges. The first is ill poseness is because uh, you have error in the measurements. They are amplified in the reconstruction and end up in an unstable algorithm, which is very sensitive to noise. And the solution is to force the solution, candidate solution, to be regular by using a constraint that is called regularization and actually acts as a filter on noise. And it makes more stable reconstruction. The second challenge is the nonlinearity. Uh, the sensitivity function used to invert the measurements is depending on the electrical properties of the object. And therefore, before we know the object, before imaging, we are using the wrong sensitivity matrix. Uh, 
And this is particularly acute for air water two phase flows because we have very high gradient of conductivity with air that is an insulating phase in a conducting phase. So it's highly nonlinear. And the solution for that is to repeat the linearized inverse problem, to iterate it, to converge slowly to the solution, and in the end, use a better candidate solution. So the approach due to limitations in the time available for this study has been to implement a preliminary non-iterative linear algorithm with regularization. And the main uh, features are that it's easy to implement and you can have online reconstruction. It will be very fast to make images. But however, it's not optimal for either fractions, so no, for very nonlinear uh, problems. And so the algorithm uh, first computes the sensitivity matrix in the 3D volume using the regularization technique uh, called NOZER. And then in the second step, it's due to the fact that I'm not expecting to reconstruct a 3D uh, object because all my electrodes are on the same actual plane. And for that very reason, what I expect to reconstruct is the cross-sectional image <coughs> that correspond to the actually average uh, object to the uh, 3D object over the sensitivity volume. So those operations are the one I apply on the sensitivity matrix in 3D to turn it to a 2D sensitivity matrix, which shall we use in the inversion of the measurements. And so this step is very fast. And in the end, you have an algorithm that this is the experiment and the reconstruction. And so in almost no time, you get uh, images which are a linearized version of the inverse problem. I'd like uh, to have a quick word about the importance of the regularization. Uh, on this image, you see on the top the experiment and then the reconstructions using different levels of regularization. So regularization is adding this penalty term to the error cost function you want to uh, minimize. And so when you don't have it, uh, the algorithm is extremely sensitive to noise and it proposes a candidate solution with high contrast, as you can see on this image. Um, it better corresponds to the noisy data, but that's not realistic. So when you introduce a moderate level of regularization, by forcing the candidate solution to be regular, it makes the reconstruction more stable. So if you add a little bit of noise, the solution will not change much. It will still be, uh, fit the data quite good. And when you increase too much the regularization, the, <coughs> it's possible that this term exceeds the fidelity term, in which case the candidate solution will now be regular but not best match the data. So in the end, you want to find the moderate level of regularization to perform the reconstruction. So with this uh, algorithm, I could uh, compute images in almost no time. And now the question of assessing spatial resolution of electrical tomography is a very complex one because of uh, the nonlinearity. And so the idea was to make perform benchmark experiments. So 64 of them. So I made some experiments with the plastic rods and uh, collected the uh, reconstructions. And with all these, <coughs> experiments, I can compare different versions of my code. So it's practical. And there's one particular uh, estimate of the figure of merit of the algorithm we are interested in is the cross-sectional average fraction. So for that, uh, I sum the activities of all pixels in my reconstruction, and I'm hoping that it will fit uh, the experiment. So on this uh, figure, you can see the comparison of the uh, estimation with the reality. And the observation is that <coughs> it works very good for low void fractions, but it starts deviating for high void fractions. That's expected because at the present time, the algorithm is non-iterative, and I'm using a priori solution that is the case of 0% void fraction. So there will be a bias for high void fractions and uh, that's expected from the algorithm. And, but we can use this benchmark experiments 
to see how it will improve with different versions of the algorithm. And so the conclusion is that we need iterative reconstruction or a better guess. And there's a lot of ideas to use either other sensors or other, for example, the regime identification prediction to propose a better guess and directly start from a good approximation to the image. Finally, let me quickly conclude and give some perspective for this research. So there was a high-speed electrical impedance tomograph that was developed, a uh, modular test section for ambient flow measurements, and uh, two algorithms for analyzing the signal, the flow regime identification method, and the image reconstruction technique which is non-iterative and regular, regularized. So here you see the illustration of the sensor used in uh, online imaging mode, uh, which gives an estimation of the volt fractions. But actually it can also, and more importantly, be used in high-speed logging for offline analysis of the results. So we are not forced to use uh, online uh, reconstruction techniques with, uh, which have limitations. There's perspectives for each of the chapter uh, of this thesis. So concerning the image reconstruction, first would be to implement uh, offline iterative reconstruction or to use the online reconstruction using a dictionary of sensitivity matrices that would be pre-computed. And then the question would be uh, how to branch the correct uh, model uh, the correct uh, index of this uh, sensitivity matrix dictionary uh, based on uh, uh, the flow regime identification prediction. And there's also uh, perspectives for trying to change the sensitivity of the measurements uh, by tuning slightly the weights uh, for each of the measurements and to find a set of weights that uh, try to flatten out the sensitivity, for example, or to get other shapes of sensitivity. There's many perspectives as well for the flow regime identification. Uh, first being to generalize it to the impedance tomography sensor, so to perform uh, flow measurements with this prototype. Uh, maybe to use other setups, different pipe diameters, pipe angles, different phases. Uh, then to implement the second step of the methodology, so based on the knowledge of the flow regime, we aim at uh, finding the parameters and in particular the water fraction. For example, in a numerical study, I uh, made the calibration curve to estimate the water fraction for stratified flow. So that's ideas. And finally, uh, it would be interesting to use machine learning methods uh, to, perform, to perform the regime identification in different manners. Finally, there's other perspectives more about the hardware and different applications. So first of all, being to implement that uh, high pressure at temperature test section. So that's a lot of work. But the idea might be to use uh, ceramic uh, coating, which provides insulation and it's scratch resistant and uh, it withstands high temperatures and pressure. It's possible to use it for imaging liquid metals flow and uh, usually the challenge in these uh, applications are very different. Uh, they are interested in two lower fraction measurements. And now the challenge will be dominated by the sensitivity, sensitivity of the sensor more than by the reconstruction techniques because the problem will be more linear. Uh, and there's ideas to use it for uh, profiling the temperature of uh, mono single phase flow in, it's a different uh, interpretation of the conductivity distribution that you make. So I'd like to finish on this quote by Albert Einstein. If you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. And on that, I love that the presentation was clear enough. And I'd like to thank you all for your kind attention today. Thank you.